I'd like to go ahead and get started. So uh, before I introduce tonight's guest, I just want to say that this is the last uh, public, distinguished public lecture in the series this year, but they'll be starting up again in the fall. And uh, <clears throat> we have, I'll just mention briefly, the first three folks starting out the beginning of the fall include uh, Anthony Rosenzweig, the Chief of Cardiology at Mass General Hospital from Harvard Medical School will be here to kick off the series, followed by Peter Rosenbaum, um, who will be uh, from uh, McMaster University in Canada. Uh, and he will be talking about disabilities in the 21st century. Uh, what are we thinking, talking, and doing about it? And then that will be followed by Carla Schatz from Stanford University, who's the uh, SAP Family Provostial Professor at Stanford. We'll be talking about synapses lost and found, developmental critical periods, and Alzheimer's disease. So we have a, those are just the first three speakers. There'll be others, and if you stay tuned and watch the website, you'll be seeing uh, all the talks coming up in the fall. And those of you on our mailing list will be bombarded by emails from me, as you know. And those of you who aren't on the mailing list and would like to be bombarded by emails from me, please, on the way out, give your email address to the folks out there. Okay. So it is a pleasure today to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Eldar Shafir from Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shafir uh, got here today over some very interesting circumstances that I won't go into details for you, but let's say it involved a couple airplanes and weather and schedules and a lot of things, but he persevered and got here, so we, we are extremely grateful for him uh, staying with it and coming to visit us. Um, Dr. Shafir holds a number of titles. He's Professor of Psychology and Public Affairs at Princeton, also the Class of 1987 Professor of Behavioral Sciences and Public Policy. Uh, also uh, w is appointed within the Woodrow Wilson School of Policy and International Affairs, and he's the first director, the inaugural director of the Kahneman Treisman Center for Public and International Affairs at Princeton. So he's very involved with key leadership roles uh, at Princeton in addition to the usual professorial responsibilities. Uh, he did his training at Brown University and then MIT where he studied cognitive science and then did postdoctoral work at Stanford University before he joined the faculty at Princeton, uh, late 80s or so. He's been at Princeton a while now. Um, he's served in all sorts of important visiting professor positions. I won't list them all, don't worry, but a few I think that I'd like to mention. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, uh, visiting fellow of the Hebrew University Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, and a visiting professor at Oxford. Uh, he was elected last year to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, in addition, he holds a number of other uh, honorific titles and important roles as a fellow, such as a fellow of the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, a uh, member of the World Economic Forum Council on Future of Behavioral Science. Uh, he was named by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the 100 leading global thinkers. Uh, he was a member of President Obama's Advisory Council on uh, Financial uh, Credibility and also serves on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Urban Institute Partnership Board. So uh, for his work that he's been duly recognized, he has been asked to take leadership roles in a whole host of things that affect national and global policy and I think is a wonderful example of how first class uh, academic uh, research can lead to effects on the entire world and policy and he certainly lives that. Uh, he's done a, a lot of studies, has a lot of papers, not time to talk about them. I just want to mention a couple things that I find particularly fascinating. Uh, his work on poverty and cognitive function I think is really um, uh, game changing in many ways and important. Uh, he points out through those studies that poverty itself can reduce cognitive capacity, for example, uh, as poverty related concerns consume mental resources. So these are a series of studies that he really, I think, showed causality, not just correlative relationships between poverty and mental function, and talks about the idea of being poor uh, <clears throat> and coping with shortfalls uh, can lead to shortfalls of cognitive resources. Uh, so therefore, policies that reduce economic volatility actually can enable greater cognitive resources. And he thinks about this in the context that I, as a neuroscientist, particularly am attracted to, um, the idea that poverty can capture the attentional resources of the brain, triggering intrusive thoughts and reducing otherwise cognitive resources that would be available. So I think just giving us insights on how something that is looked at uh, from different perspectives by different groups such as poverty to begin to understand how it can drive and affect our lives, the function of our brain, behavior, everyday lives, and trying to inform policy about that I think is phenomenally important. He has also addressed the stigmatization of poverty uh, that can lead to cognitive distancing, 
uh, and uh, taught us that uh, from his studies that self-affirmation -affirm can actually, in some cases, mitigate the stigma of poverty. And so to begin to understand how those things can change uh, the course of things, I think, is also extremely important. And then finally, I just want to mention a study he did on the martyrdom effect uh, on the prospects of enduring pain and exerting effort uh, leading to pro-social causes and investment. We often think of a, a very kind of traditional view of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain and so forth, and his studies have given us insights to understand how people can actually look at challenges that might produce pain or having to do a lot of effort and can actually stimulate people's partic participation and giving in pro-social efforts. So I think those are just a couple examples of the importance uh, of Dr. Shafir's work, and we're really uh, very pleased to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elder. Thank you. That, that was not only an extremely kind introduction, but certainly one of the most well-informed I've ever received. I almost don't have to give my talk, but, but I'll do it anyway. So um, it's great to be here. And uh, what, I, what I thought I would do is um, start by trying to give you a few minutes of an overview, sort of Behavioral Psych 101 Express, sort of the, how I think about behavioral science before we get to the issues of poverty that I want to focus on today. Uh, sort of the perspective from which I come. It's quite different from, you know, more careful neuroscience imaging kind of work that you may have been exposed to here more. It's very behaviorally uh, informed. It comes from social science, from sociology, from other areas. It eventually gets to work that's more cognitive and neuroscience, but it starts from a set of, of studies that really, I think, changed our, our understanding. I could have chosen many. I'm going to start with one or two that have kind of entered popular culture. Some of you will recognize them, but I want to give you my rendition of them. Uh, so this is a famous study that uh, Stanley Milgram did at the Department of Psych at Yale. Uh, he basically, so these are a group of European psychologists who come to the US during and after the Second World War, sort of obsessed with understanding the German mind, uh, you know, what made the German mind to do the things it did. We, of course, now know there's nothing German about it. It's the mind that all of us carry behind the eyes and between the ears somewhere. Uh, but it's an, an interesting story. So in, in this particular study, uh, Milgram recruits middle-aged men to the psych department at Yale. They come, they think they're being randomly assigned to teachers or students, but in fact, all the participants will be uh, teachers. The student, the one sitting down attached to electrodes, is a confederate, he's an actor, he's working for the experimenter. They meet, then the, the subject, the teacher, goes to the other side of the room to be on the partition, and it's a paired associate study. The, the task is irrelevant to us. Basically, I teach you paired associates, like house, banana. Later, when I say house, you, the student, is supposed to say banana. If you get it right, bravo, we move on. If you get it wrong, I'll give you a slight electric shock. Uh, and every time I give you one, the lever stays down, so I know where I am. And as we progress, I get progressively higher and higher in the shocks that I administer to you, should I choose as a subject to do so. Now, uh, this is very carefully choreographed, so it starts from low vaults, and the subject, uh, the uh, actor, the student, grunts progressively higher. If you choose to go to 150, he screams, get me out of here, I told you I have heart trouble, which he happens to mention when they first meet. If you keep going, still at 270, there are blood curtain screams of agony. The original tapes are available on, on NPR, you can actually hear them. And if you keep going still, at 3.30, you say, house, nothing comes back. Total silence after the guy screamed and told you he has heart trouble. 3.30, 3.40, 3.50, 3.60, 3.70, up to 4.50, you would be asking questions and nothing at all comes back if you were to do so. Now, um, here's sort of a close-up. It goes up to triple X danger. Why would anybody do any of this? You saw this dude, very distinguished gentleman who works for Yale University, very overconfident in a white robe. And he insists it's very important the experiment continue. Please continue. It's imperative that the study continue. This is the sort of pressure that's put on the participants. Now, um, Milgram, who was a magnificent researcher, had another important insight, which was to interview people. He went to, this is, you know, early 60s, early 70s. He went to people and gave them a full rendition of what I just, much more detailed rendition of the study, and asked them to predict what will people do. Everybody predicts disobedience. The average prediction is that about 135 volts, when the grunts get loud, people will disobey, will, will refuse to continue. No one predicts that anybody will go above 300, except for the psychiatrists, the experts in human behavior in the northeast of the US 
in the 60s and 70s who recognized that one in a thousand will be a sociopath. That's the predictions. What Milgram finds is that 65% of all these nice people are sociopaths and that everybody goes above 300. Now, the reason I, I can never stop from starting with the study is that to, we can spend a whole afternoon on it. I mean, it, we have a proof here that we just didn't understand this about human behavior. The experts, the people, nobody could predict this. If you look at the, in, uh, the correspondence between Milgram and the NIH, who's funding him, he had the plan to find the opposite. He had the plan to show that Americans are nothing like the Germans. He's blown away. He's getting not what we expected. He then goes to Bennington College, the bastion of leftist liberalism at the time, and they look worse than New Haven did. <laughs> he, he can't get rid of it. And he's completely blown away. And so this is a true discovery about the power of the situation. This is a kind of, kind of the first lesson you'd get in social psych today. And the other one that comes along with it, the reason all of us are sort of surprised and why it's so important is that the, it, it's, the situation is extremely powerful and we tend not to get it. So most people in this room obviously assume they would not have been among those who gave the shock and most people in this room are profoundly wrong about that. And when you open the paper and you read about Abu Ghraib, it's, even if you took the right Psych 101, it's very hard to say these are wonderful people in a bad place we put them in as opposed to these are not good people. And this is a really deep issue about how much power we recognize the situation has and how do we discount or afford for it when we interpret behaviors. It becomes a very important issue in policy making because if you don't take context seriously enough, they lead to bad behaviors and bad policies. Now, when I say situations in context, not all of them have to involve complicated electrocutions. It could be trivial stuff. When you go into the supermarket, somebody has carefully placed the cereal in the right place because how they design the context of the shop or the supermarket or the office space or the classroom, we now know has an effect. So if you look at books like Nudge, there's a number of books recently that have sort of looked at how do we shape the situation in benign ways to just lead people to have a better life. And if we don't do that, things go less well. Sometimes unintentionally, I just love this, this data. So as restaurants compete to attract us because they serve us more generous portions, plates have gone from an average of nine to 12 inches in diameter in the last 50 years. Don't forget, you're supposed to do pi r squared. So you're getting a lot more <laughs> spaghetti here than here. And this one is beautiful. This comes directly from the CDC. Literally, if you go now to lunch and you order an average burger, you eat exactly three of your grandmother's burgers. So every lunch you have is three times what our grandparents used to have for lunch at the same place. And that's a classic example of, you know, now why is this important? It's important, of course, because if you are the sort of economic agent that we sometimes assume, you know, inhabits economics textbooks, who decided that today I consume 800 calories, it doesn't really matter what plate they give you. You consume 800 calories, but of course that's not how we live. We sit down to eat, and Mike is really interesting, and conversation is flowing, I don't even notice what's on my plate, and I eat it all. And so as a result, we eat a lot more, and this has become an issue. Um, this is a lovely picture, so this picture basically... <laughs> <laughs> This is a, a, a metaphorical rendition of what I call the intention-action tension. A lot of our lives, how we eat, how we exercise, how much we save for retirement, has to do with the tension between what we intend to do and what we do. And it's a classic case where you can design contexts that make it easier to do the right thing or less, or, or not, not as easy. Now, if you're in North Korea, it turns out you can do this. But in the US, <laughs> In the U.S., it's not so easy, so we have to find more nuanced ways to drive people to do the right things. And, for example, in finance, in the last 10 or 20 years, there have been real victories. Uh, this is a sort of a summary of one of many studies that David Lapson at Harvard and his colleagues have done. Basically, what this shows you is when you come, when, when I hire you to work for me, I say, welcome, this is, the, this is our contract, and you should know that from now on, I'm going to default you to 2% retirement savings uh, from your, deducted automatically from your salary every month. Here's a phone number, 24-7, feel free anytime to call and ask to make it higher or lower. Other people will come to the same hiring firms on different days, different weeks. Welcome, everything is the same. I'm defaulting you to 5% instead of 2 a month. Here's a phone number, feel free to call anytime you want. For many people who are going to stay working there for 30 or 40 years, it's a very important decision how much you put for retirement. 
What this shows you is these are people four years later, we're working in the same office. We play ping pong together, we go out for beer, we meet in the water fountain. Those who are defaulted into more are retiring significantly richer than those who have been defaulted into less, although the only thing I have to do is a single phone call. Okay, so this has now been taken very seriously. At Princeton, where I work, human resources actually use these techniques to lead people to, to, to save more because faculty, so the, the office sends faculty postcards about thinking about how much you want to save for retirement. We know this, they're sent three times a year. If you've been in Princeton 30 years, you receive nearly 100 of them. And faculty come in and say, nobody ever told me. <laughs> Never heard of this before. And so these become now very important. They're also important in another segment of society. This a FAFSA, uh, many people here might be on FAFSA or have been on FAFSA, uh, is the single most generous benefit program that's given to Americans today. It's basically money to go to college if you can't afford it. Not only is it the money, but it's you know, lifetime of expected earnings and uh, a difference in your life. Take up a FAFSA is about a third of eligibles. So a third of Americans are eligible to get FAFSA, get it. The rest don't. And of course, the question is, do they not understand? Do they not care about being educated? What's going on? This is the form. Uh, of course, after you've been asked six questions you don't understand, you're reminded you, you're answering under the penalty of perjury, so you go to jail if you answer incorrectly, and you know, it's, it's a mess. But still the question is, why are people not answering? So in one study, for example, oh, what happened here? Oh, I'm, not, I'm missing the data. Okay. Uh, if the bars came out, they'd show you the following. If you say to people, I know everything about you, I know your household income, your parents' income, you are entitled to FAFSA. Here is the form. Take up exactly the same as before. So we know it's not a question of knowledge. Now that I tell you you're eligible, there's no difference. Next version, I know about your household income, I know your parents' household income, you're eligible for FAFSA. Here is the form. Let's fill it out together. And actual matriculation in college goes up by over 25%. So now filling it out together is one hour of somebody at minimum wage. It's much cheaper than other things the government has tried to do to raise participation in FAFSA. And it's, again, it's these nuances of behavior that we have to kind of understand because if you try to do cost-benefit analyses, which is, I assume, something that many of you in this room have, have been taught, there's no way you can compute the cost that's imputed for my filling out a form that stands to give me $80,000. You know, there's no way my hour is worth $40,000. So you can't do it. There's something else going on. Basically, the form is enough to stop people. It's an obstacle of sorts. They're not looking at the form and saying, I hereby de declare I'll never go to college. They're looking at the form and say, uh, OK, this is complicated. I'll wait for my sister to come back from Chicago for the weekend. She'll help me. Something will happen. Life goes by, and they don't do it. Okay, so these are the kind of things that we've now been working on as a society to induce better behaviors with small tweaks. So that's the behavioral story. Things happen not because you don't want it or because you don't understand it, but because life is complicated, the context induces you to go in different places, and the context has this enormous power. When uh, Sandal Mulanathan, a good friend and colleague who was an economist at Harvard and I and a few others started to look at poverty, what impressed us most is that poverty is a very, very powerful context. And if you're somebody who takes context of situation seriously, poverty is the ultimate situation where bad things happen. Uh, apart from the financial difficulties that I'll talk about, you know, you're living in neighborhoods that are noisy and crime-ridden, and, and, and there's many other things going on that make it complicated. People look at you badly, et cetera. So we wanted to look at that. And when you look <laughs> in literature in general, what you find is that the poor behave badly. So if you go to simple work, work on health, if you look at adherence, for example, people need to take the medication. Even if you control for liquidity and accessibility, even if you look at people who have the medication, the poor are the biggest culprits. They're the worst at, at adhering the medication as they ought to relative to their rich friends. If you move all the way to the fields of India, weeding your field is a relatively low skill task that increases your income significantly. Development work shows that poor farmers weed their fields less than richer farmers next to them. If you look at parenting, we're just talking about that, enormous amount of literature how the poor are inconsistent, bad, lacking in discipline, lacking in attention, doing things badly. Uh, in finance, we can talk for hours, the poor are doing things terribly badly. I wrote payday loans. Payday loans, I don't know how many of you here know the story. Payday loans are one of the many dramas happening in Ameri on American streets today that are truly painful. So basically, 
To get a payday loan, you have to be working. It's a payday loan. And so the risk of you defaulting is actually pretty low. You basically give a, a prepaid check for when you get paid. You're working, but you're running out of money. You need $200 before the end of the month, and you go and get a loan. Those loans are given as a short-term loan at very high interest. The implied APR, the implied yearly rate, if you compute it, is somewhere between 400 and 1,000%. Now, here is the story. When I need $200 and you give me $200 and I owe you 240 in two weeks, if I didn't have 200 this month, how am I going to have 240 next month? If I win the lottery, I'm okay. Otherwise, what do I do? I take a payday loan. So what you find is that people who take payday loans average between 10 and 15 payday loans a year, where, I don't know the numbers exactly, but last time I saw a statistic, it suggested that if you take a random payday loan given in the street of America today, 70, 70% 70 of it goes to pay a previous loan. So you've turned the poor into money pumps or just paying a lot of money to have no money. It looks terrible. Why would anybody do this? The classic argument is that the poor are myopic, they're not planning carefully, they're not thinking about the future, they're being unsophisticated. Okay? And that's one of many, many, many critiques, you've got to come back to it later. But this is the kind of the many critiques you get throughout, everywhere you look, where the poor seem to be behaving badly. So that's what we got interested. Um, I'm putting this to say there's a lot of important work on behavior under poverty. Uh, that I, I'm putting this to say these are all real, I'm not doubting them. There's so, no doubt peer effects, there's neighborhood effects. I'm not questioning this. Some of them I think are stronger than others, but that's not the point. The point is I want to abstract away from all this and simply ask, what's the psychology that intervenes between being in poverty and behavior, and how can we shed some light on that? Okay, so that's, that's really the question. Uh, and the book that Senna and I wrote that captures some of it, this is kind of the, the basic story. What we argue in the book is that Putting people in context of poverty produces its own psychology. In particular, you're very, very busy juggling issues of poverty. And by the way, I'll mention later, it doesn't have to be poverty in money, it could be in other areas, but when you are, have a profound lack of an important resource, your mind is devoted to managing this thing you don't have enough of. And when your mind is devoting to managing the thing you don't have enough of, you just have less mind left for other things. And when you have less money left for other things in context of poverty, bad things happen. That's going to be basically the story. Um, we tell a, a sort of a metaphor. People like it, so I give it, but I'm going to do this quickly. We tell a, a metaphor of basically going through life with a suitcase. That's your budget. Some of us have a very big suitcase, a lot of slack in the suitcase. You put a few things in, no problem. Others have a very small, small tightly packed suitcase. So imagine yourself going for the weekend to Chicago. You throw your massive suitcase on the bed. You start throwing things in. Let's assume you're not going to take everything you have in the house, and let's assume you throw them in an increasing order of importance. So you throw one, two, three, ten things, you have everything you need. It didn't take you very long, you didn't have to focus, you close, so close the suitcase, you're ready. Now imagine doing the same thing with a very small suitcase. You start throwing things in, by thing four or five, you're running out of space. You have to stop doing other stuff, focus on your packing. Ask yourself, what do I need? You become an expert in what takes more room in your small suitcase, the boots or the coat. It's a whole different level. When you travel and you need something, in a big suitcase, you just toss it in. In a small suitcase, you have to ask yourself, what do I take out of the suitcase to put the stuff, the thing I didn't know I needed, in it? So it's trade-off thinking. Anyway, we, we work more on this. is actually beautiful work in computational complexity that actually is called the packing problem, which is how to put many things in a small space. In the book, we talk a lot about poverty that's not about money. I'm going to skip most of it for today. But let me just say, Many people in this room are time poor in ways that are not completely relevant, different from the way that our subjects are money poor. You have to think, so I have a very good friend who works very hard painting houses. At five o'clock, he's done. If I ask him, do you want to go to the movies? He says, what's the movie? Many people in this room, if I ask, do you want to go to the movies? Your, your answer is, what's the movie? And what do I not do tonight that I had to do tonight, I'll have to do tomorrow. You're in trade-off thinking mode, just like the poor do with money. It's interesting, if you think about money, by the way, in economics, everything you spend has a trade-off. Even if you're Gates and you spend $1,000, it's $1,000 you want you to be leaving to your children. There's always a trade-off. What's interesting is for many people in America today, many people I assume in this room, when you buy a book or a CD or go out to lunch with a friend or have a coffee, you don't stop to ask yourself, what will I not have instead? It's as if you're reaching into an infinite bucket of small expenses and no trade-offs. The person who, se who serves you the coffee does ask themselves, what will I not buy instead if I go to lunch with a friend? They do trade-off thinking a lot more often. 
But that's the classic thing that you get. And this lack of slack, this idea that you don't have enough and you have to juggle trade-offs and worry about unexpected expenses, is extremely common. I'm not going into this, but if you look at the literature of the poor in America today, it's extremely common that there are things you don't have and that you encounter ma massive hardships. The other thing I want to say is when I talk today about uh, the poor making decisions, it's important that you realize I'm not talking about you know, the abject poor in a corner who is homeless. I'm talking about simply people who cannot finish the month. That today depends exactly where you look is roughly a third of America. So in the most successful nation in human history, about a third of us cannot simply finish the month. And I'm not, I don't mean that we cannot afford the yacht. I mean, we just can't finish the month as modest, reasonable American families. Those are the people I'm talking about. And it's important to think about. So when you read that 46 million Americans are poor, what you're reading is that 46 million Americans are below the poverty line. The poverty line is a technical measure. It's outdated. In any case, it doesn't matter. That's what you're reading. That's important. Uh, let me just give you through one classic story. This woman, Angelique, lives in North Carolina. She's a mother of two. Uh, her income is 7,500, which is way below the poverty line for somebody of her status in a place where she lives. So she counts as poor. But then we give her benefits. So we give her EITC, WIC, other programs. When you count all that together, there's a suppl supplemental poverty measure that we use. And she's now making 18.8 which is more than the poverty line, and Angelique no longer counts as poor. She's not among the 46 million we talk about when you read the paper. The problem is that if you look, there are several organizations in the US that compute the living wage. The living wage, as opposed to the poverty line, is the amount of money you need to live a minimally acceptable life in a time and place in which you live. And for Angelique, that happens to be 34,000. So although we gave her enough to bring her to the 19 and don't, don't count her anymore, she's getting half of what she needs to finish the month minimally comfortably. And these are the people I'm talking about. These are people who simply cannot finish the month for whom concerns about money and juggling finances become a predominant, everlasting issue. One other f footnote. Um, when you talk about the American poor, there's Often somebody who says, you know, what exactly do you mean American poor? You know, if you put them in New Delhi, they'd be middle class. And I'm, I address this because I, we, all under, we all know where it comes from. We understand the preoccupation, but it's, it's misleading. So I want to attack it while it's young. Um, this is a classic thing you see. You see people counting the fact that a lot of the American poor have air conditioning, color televisions, as if you can buy black and white if you wanted to. But anyway, they have this, you know, very comfortable life. And the, the most recent one was the Heritage Foundation. Again, they counted all the air conditioning and cable TV. Now, what's interesting about this is <clears throat> every time this happens, you read in all the papers these statistics, all the poor of air conditioning. But nobody tells you, you know, what does this mean? Okay, the air conditioning, what am I supposed to make of that? Except for a few observers of the American scene. So uh, Steve Colbert says, this report proves that the poor are just not living down to our expectations. If you still have the strength to brush the flies off your eyes balls, you're not really poor. This is Colbert's very vulgar way of saying exactly what the Heritage Foundation meant to say. Uh, John Stewart says, never realized poor had it so good. No wonder the middle class is pouring into their ranks and droves. And well, here is what's so interesting. 370 years earlier than this, uh, Adam Smith, in his inimitable way, solves it very clearly. He says, look. It used to be the case that you, as a British laborer, you're not expected to wear a linen shirt to go to work. Fine. Now that you are expected to wear a linen shirt to go to work, now that you are expected to be at home with a TV or internet, now that you are expected to have air conditioning, if you don't have it, you're poor. So of course standards change. To say to you 300 years ago, running water in your household was an impossible dream, stop complaining, is to miss the point. And so I'm gonna talk very, very clearly and non-defensively in the following way, somebody who cannot live the minimally acceptable life in the time and place in which they live is poor. Of course, they're not as dramatically, horribly poor as somebody who's dying in Biafra, but they're not making it in a psychologically very important way. Okay, um, moving on. So in our story, what happens when you're juggling poverty is you're focusing a lot of your resources on that thing you're juggling. And that has clear implications. If you look 
at what the poor attend to, what they know, what they think about. And by the way, I'm going to say the poor as if I know exactly what that means. You all understand this is a very vulgar terminology. Some of us here may be poor. Some of us were poor. So um, you, bear with me. But if you do these studies, for example, in marketing, there's a lot of research in marketing. If you simply stand outside of a supermarket and ask people for the household income and divide them into high and low and ask them for the receipt and ask them, how much did you pay for the pasta today or for the turkey or how much did you spend in the supermarket today? The poor know these answers a lot better than the rich. That's where they're focused. Um, we did the study that I really like. We stood outside South Station in Boston. When people came out, we got their household income. And then we asked them, by the way, when you walk into a cab in Boston, and into a taxi, what does the meter read? Now, it's nice because clearly the rich take taxis more than the poor, but they're much less likely to know the answer. And so I want to leave you with that. I'm going, to, I want, I'm going to try to leave you with a few images at stake. This is one. When you're rich and you enter the taxi, you look at the Charles River and say, oh, what a beautiful day. When you're poor, you're looking at the meter. That's where your mind is. That's where you're focusing. Um, one thing we learned uh, in the literature that was very amusing, so that this is not my studies, this is in, in marketing. The claim is that if you go to neighborhoods that are wealthy in America, up to 25% of the items in a supermarket shelf exhibit what's known as a quantity surcharge. And what that means is the following. When you go buy spinach, half a pound of spinach costs $4, and a pound costs 9 Now, if you're listening to me, you should say, no, no, you're confused, and that's the point. I'm not confused. They know that you, wealthy customer, can't bother to check the unit price. You assume that the bigger one gives you a better deal, so you grab it, and you give the company a dollar gift. What the marketing research finds is that this phenomenon of quantity surcharge cannot be found in poor neighborhoods. They just don't fall for it. They check very carefully, and they see that two half pounds cost less than a pound, and they take two half pounds. So there's a lot of evidence. They're very attentive, very thoughtful, very thorough. They know exactly what they're doing. They're thinking trade-offs all the time, but that's where their mind is. And when your mind is there, focusing, a lot of things are going to, that's, it imposes a load on you. It, it keeps you busy in ways that other things become less, less, less available to your attention. We talk about uh, tunneling. It's a, actually it's a term that exists actually in perception research very carefully. But again, it's the idea is that as you're focusing on what's urgent, stuff that's important is just in the periphery. So again, if you want a thought experiment, we've had a few of these recently. Think of yourself driving through a massive storm. It's raining like crazy and you're driving. Your attention is entirely four feet in front of the car. You're not going to pay attention to the billboards. You might not even notice the stop signs. You're, you, you're focus, focusing only on the driving and you might miss the stop sign. And that's the point here is you're tunneling on the thing that's most important to you right now, the kids' lunch, school uniforms, rent, and other things that might be very important for your financial life even, not to mention other things like retirement and health care. You're not focused on today, even though you recognize it's important. Okay, so that's going to be the story. And for that, um, it's important to remind you that there's two concepts. If you remember in the first slide, I want to convince you of is the important of con importance of context of the situation and our limited bandwidth, our limited cognitive capacity. Our limited cognitive capacity is another one of those stories that are kind of amusing because we just don't get it. So you might know that today, for example, in many states in the US, you're not allowed to hold your phone and drive. This is only because it's the only thing they can sell to the public. Anybody who does a research knows that the hands are irrelevant. As long as you're using cell phone in the car, no hands held, this has been research done in simulators, when you're driving and speaking on a cell phone, no hands held, your reaction time and your ability to detect the periphery equals somebody who's legally drunk. That's how limited we're now. You know, I say this to you, and you and I will both get in the car and drive and talk on the phone because we think we can beat it. We just don't have the introspective access to how limited this can be. Um, a lot of amusing work in behavioral research has done the following sort of manipulation. There's different versions, but it basically looks as following. I ask this half of the room, please remember two digits for me, one seven. Don't forget one seven. This half I ask, please don't forget seven digits, one seven, two, five, four, six, two. Please don't forget. Now, from the research, we know that the half who's retaining seven digits will eat less well, will be more likely to forget to call their kids or their mothers for, on their birthday, will be less likely to notice a dude dressed as a clown on a unicycle going through the room. Your head is busy. 
And the argument here is going to be that when you're juggling insufficient resources and managing them, it's like walking around retaining six digits in your head. Your head is busy in ways that we otherwise fail to appreciate. We cover one story that's incredible that we found in the literature. This is a study done by sociologists in a school in Connecticut that happened to divide uh, elementary school kids into one of two classrooms. That happened to be one classroom is, is in the quiet side of the school, and the other one is near the train tracks. So on occasional times throughout the day, a train goes outside the window. Are trains distracting? Yeah, trains are distracting. How distracting are they? These guys find that by fifth grade, the kids in a train side of the school are one year behind in academic performance. It's a massive effect. They install soundproofing and the kids catch up. It's a classic story. And so, again, another memorable thought experiment. Imagine yourself in a very quiet room. No distractions, no trains outside. You're trying to do something, but you're worried about your kids' food for Friday or your rent. Those are internal trains. There's nothing outside the window, but those internal trends are going to interfere with your ability to focus and think in very similar ways. And that's a limited bandwidth. Another feature that's interested, interesting about scarcity, not having enough, is not only does it occupy your mind, but you almost can't get rid of it. You can't think of other things. This is an amazing set of studies. Um, if you go to any conference on nutrition today, they all know this study extremely well, but nobody else does. This, in 1943, when the Allied forces realized that at some point they're going to inherit lots of starving people in European camps, they also realized they didn't know how to feed them. Feeding the starving is, you know, it's a coming down from the Everest. It's, it's, a, it's a science in itself. So they hired Ansel Keys, who was a leading nutritionist at the time in Minnesota, to study how to feed the starving. But of course, to feed the starving, he had to starve people first. So he got these conscientious objectors, very, very impressive, talented, highly educated young men, to volunteer to starve. Not to death, but to massive discomfort. So the, the physical descriptions of these studies are really very touching. These guys are too weak to keep their arms above their heads long enough to wash their hair. They need pillows to sit down. There's no padding left, etc. We were more interested in the psychological part, which is embedded in those descriptions. And basically, you have these guys, these very highly educated, impressive guys. That they're hungry. They don't really want to think about food. And all they do all day long is memorize recipes, compare prices of food items in different newspapers. All of them are planning to become restaurateurs. It's really quite amusing. At some point, the experimenter feels so bad, they show them a movie. And the testimonials of the subjects is, they showed us a movie. I couldn't care less about the love scenes. I just wanted to see the meals. That's where their mind is. And so in some sense, the argument is going to be that when you have this need, whether it's time, money, food, that captures your cognitive capacity, both when you think, as it were, slowly, when you intend to think about things, but also when you think quickly, even when you don't mean to think about them, at a very, very low level. And so the classic kind of study you can think of, it's not our study, but it's a nice study people did where they asked subjects not to think, not to drink anything for four hours. So all the subjects arrive after having not had no drink for four hours, they're thirsty. By random assignment, half get water, and the other half get pretzels. Not a good thing when you're thirsty. And now their task is to identify words, a classic word identification task. Just say, is this a word in English or not? But what you find is those who had the pretzels, those who are thirsty, identify thirst-related words significantly faster than those who had water compared to control words where you don't get the effect. Now, why is this interesting? These are decisions that take less than half a second. It's like 400 millisecond decisions. And so what you're, saying, what you're showing here is that when you're thirsty or hungry, not only do you choose to talk about it, but your brain identifies the related words in less than half a second. It's literally what's activated in your semantic network. It's where your brain is. So all of the system is basically invested in this thing you don't have enough of. But of course, when you do that, it interferes with other things. We did one study that's kind of amusing. These are dieters. And so half the subjects are dieting, and the other half are controls. This is done in California. You, it's a classic word search, so you have to find the words that are in this, in this grid. And there's two versions. You see here the, the odd number of words are diet related, so cake, donut, sweets, indulge. And the even number of words are controls. Here, we switch all the odd number of words from diet related to neutral but the even-related words are identical. 
What I'm going to do now is look at how long it takes you to find the even, the even number of words, which are identical in both cases, as a function of whether or not the surrounding words are related to that or they're not. I'm going to do this for dieters and not dieters. Don't worry if it's confusing. The non dieters you get no effect at all. For the dieters, what you find is that it, the time it takes me to find cloud is significantly longer after I've just seen a donut than if I've just seen picture. So if I'm dieting and you show me a donut, it's hard for me to do the next thing. There's interference, basically. Okay, that's a, another version. And there's another study that's kind of nice. They take people who are concerned about <coughs> retirement as opposed to people who are not concerned about retirement. This is a classic Stroop test. So all you have to do here is say the color in which the word appears. Forget the word. The answer is red and then blue. That's all you have to do. And what you show is that when, if you take people who are not worried about retirement, they say blue and red equally quickly. If you take people who are worried about retirement, it takes them much longer to say red than to say blue. I want to say red, but retirement is screaming at me. Okay, so these are all examples where a concern I have interferes with my capacity to function. Uh, we've done many other studies since. I'm not going to go through all of them, but kind of the, the scarcity mindset. What does it feel like? So um, si you, re you simply read a, a, a vignette about going to a doctor. The doctor tells you news that are not good, but things will be okay at the end. So it's kind of emotionally laden, but you'll be okay. We ask people to write the words that come to mind, what they thought about when they read the, 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 the scenario. And what you find is that the rich... High-income people mostly list emotionally related words to the scenario. The poor list emotion and finance related words. So it's as if when you're poor and you hear the doctor talk to you, you're thinking not only treatment but also money while you listen to the doctor, which doesn't happen for the high income. Uh, there's, a very, there's an amusing, very old study in research on memory, which basically goes as follows. I give you a list of words, uh, father, brother, athlete, whatever, there's a bunch of words that are all related, we know, in your semantic memory to the word man. You've not seen man. I've just read all these words that are related to man. And then when I ask you which of these words you've seen before, the tendency to misidentify man as the word you've seen is much higher relative to control words because you've seen words that are associated. So we do this with man. We take rich, we take poor, we replicate it exactly the same, no difference. But then we do it again. We take a set of words like bills, electricity, rent, etc., which could be heavily associated with the word money. And what you show here is that the rich do not think they saw money and the poor think they saw money. So when I say things like electricity, the rich don't think money, the poor think money. So we have many different ways of showing that money looms very large in the minds of the poor, when, both when it's not mentioned and when it is mentioned and when it's implied, it's very, very salient. In this set of studies, we ask you to mind wander, we basically give you this beautiful picture in a big screen and ask you to lose yourself in the, on the beach or in the forest for a, for a minute and then flash words. And again, what you show is after you've been getting lost in this forest for a minute, the rich identify the words leaves and trees faster than controls. The poor do not. They still identify money faster than leaves. They can't mind wonder. They're stuck with their concerns. Anyway, with a whole set of these. So all the, all the evidence suggests that juggling insufficient resources is going to be preoccupying you centrally at the forefront of your mind and influence how you process information. The, the most impressive, in a sense, studies are the ones that Mike briefly mentioned. I'll ju just show you a brief overview. These are studies done in a mall in New Jersey. We ask people to participate, they agree, they sit in front of a computer, we're going to give them scenarios very close to everyday life, like your car breaks down, it's going to cost X dollars to fix. The scenarios come in two versions, challenging and manageable. The challenging, ver the manageable version, the car is going to cost $150 to fix, which we know for most people in the mall on a Saturday morning is manageable. The challenging ver version, the car is going to cost $1,500 to fix, which we know for half the people in the mall is a giant challenge come up with that amount of money. So there's a bunch of these scenarios, either manageable or challenging. To make it, int and you have to look at them and then decide how you're gonna go about trying to take care of this problem. To make it, things interesting, we'll let you play some games, which are sort of fun, but they're classic tasks. If you take cognitive psych, you'll, you'll know these tasks. This is a divided attention task. You have to respond as quickly as you can to the same side if you see a heart, the opposite side if you see a flower. It's, it's like a driving test, a divided attention. 
And this is uh, uh, the fluid intelligence component of the IQ. All of you have taken this test, I know for a fact, because it's the most common version of the fluid intelligence test of all IQ tests administered in schools, the job search scenario anywhere else. Uh, it's supposed to be the closest we ever came to a test that does not differentiate between a Nobel laureate physicist and a farmer. It's imperfect, but it's the closest we have. Very common. So you get these scenarios, you do these tests, and then we look at what happens. And here's what happens. If you look at the rich in the mall, how well they perform at the divided attention task does not differ whether they're fixing the cheap or the expensive car. Whether they're fixing the challenging or the manageable car, they do just as well. The poor, and we divide people by household income after they respond, the poor, when they're fixing the manageable car, the $150 car looks just like their rich friends. But when they're worried about the challenging car, the one they cannot afford, they drive less well. Their divided attention goes down. Which is, by the way, exactly what you would get if we ask these people to keep the seven digits in their head. Once you have cognitive load, you do this less well. If you go to the intelligence test, the, the rich don't care which car they're fixing. The poor are statistically identical to the rich when they're fixing the manageable car. They're significantly less capable when they're managing the challenging car. This effect, which is close to standard deviation, if you make standard, some assumptions about the distribution of the IQ test, these guys basically lost about 13 IQ points. 13 IQ points in, in the public school, my girls go to school on a qualitative scale is enough to take you from average to borderline deficient or from average to borderline gifted. It's a big effect. We know from other studies, not ours, if I kept you up all night, literally up all night with M&M blasting in the background, you would be about nine IQ points less intelligent here today. So think how that feels to take a test of not having slept all night. These guys who a minute ago were just as good as their rich friends are now doing less well. It's a big effect. There are some issues here because we control for everything, but the American poor and the American rich are different, different metabolism, different education. There's some concern, can we do this within subjects, which is complicated. You can't have somebody who's both rich and poor. But we ended up going to India where sugarcane farmers, because harvest happens once a year, these are people for whom at least 65% of their annual income comes in one, literally in one day. And because they fail to smooth, they spend the money too quickly, these are people who are basically rich after the harvest, but poor before the harvest. So they do uh, similar tests on handheld devices in the field two months before and two months after harvest. And if you look at reaction time error rates, they're about nine or 10 IQ points less capable during scarcity than during plenty. So uh, the basic point here is that scarcity demands of your cognitive resources. Uh, it focuses you. And notice it's not about poor people. It's about people you put in context of being poor. And this is for the long debate. If, to be very vulgar, there's an ongoing debate. Are you poor because you're dumb or are you dumb because you're poor? And this is very clear. These are people who are just as smart as their rich friends a minute ago. And when you impose scarcity, they do less well. In all of these cases, what you find is it's not the person, it's the, the, the context you put them in. I don't want to go into the details here, but the most satisfying study I ever ran, these are uh, Princeton undergraduates. <clears throat> you can't make them poor in money so easily, but you can make them poor in time in a lab. So they come to the lab, they play Family Feud, they're super invested and do it as best they can. Uh, by random assignment, some are rich, they have in time, they have 50 seconds per round. Some have only 15 seconds per round, they're poor in time. Also orthogonal to that, some of them, every time they finish a round, they run out of time, they have to go to the next round. Others are in a condition where they can borrow. If you run out of time and you want a few more seconds, go ahead, it just costs you, it's predatory lending. Every second you take, you lose two seconds from the bucket of time you have for this game. Okay, so it's expensive borrowing, it's like a payday loan. Um, here's to do it quickly, here's what happens. When you cannot borrow, notice the rich, those who have more time, do better than the poor. Not surprising that they have more time. If I had more time, I would convince you that they're not doing as well as they should. They're much richer, they're doing only a little bit better. And we have data basically showing that when you're poor, you are focused. You use every second really well. When you're rich, you're going to sit back there and schmooze and waste your time terribly, and you're much less efficient per unit of time. But anyway, forget all that for now. The rich do better. Now, that's when you cannot borrow. Now when you can borrow, what happens? When you have enough time, and I give you a very expensive loan, you say, nah, thank you. They borrow rarely, doesn't cost them anything, they do just as well. But what happens when you're poor? 
you're, run, you're only at 15 seconds, you're running out of time, you're pretty sure you know the answer to number two, you just need two more seconds and you really want the answer and you grab those two seconds and they cost you a lot and you basically leave the lab with a lot less money than if you couldn't borrow. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but believe me, this is very close to payday loans. So payday loans, I reminded you before, are a classic example where people say the poor are myopic and unthinking and uneducated. Nobody, I mean, you can have different opinions about Princeton students, they're not unplanning and myopic if they're at Princeton. And although a minute ago they were perfectly reasonable, the minute you put them in a context where there isn't enough and they're focusing and tunneling, they take payday loans. Okay, and so to me, this really suggests very clearly that the tendency to take, for example, stupid loans under pressure is not a characteristic of the person, it's a characteristic of the situation you put them in, which makes it now much more burning and enticing and puts other things on a back burner. Um, this is, uh, apropos uh, childcare, this says air traffic control. There's a very really beautiful study. Air traffic control is a really nice example because you have easy and bad days totally determined by chance, by weather conditions and air traffic. It's not something you've done. So you have these sociologists who sit in air traffic controllers' homes for weeks, engage interaction with spouses, with children, etc. And basically what they find is that these air traffic controllers are much better parents on easy days. Okay, and so again, it's the notion that you're an inattentive, badly disciplining, bad parent, not because that's who you are, but because you're in a situation where it's just hard to do otherwise. Um, okay, I'm just gonna run through the last few slides. One reason why, from a behavioral policy perspective, oh, this is also important, is because if you believe even part of the story, juggling scarcity, living in scarce conditions is a big challenge, it's difficult. And what you find is instead of respect, those who do this get disrespected. And instead of help, they get sabotaged. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but just to tell you, the, the research on disrespect is plenty. A lot of work on basically, if you look at, if you do multidimensional space analyses of stereotypes around the world, there are places where it's better or worse to be a woman or a Muslim or a Jew or other things. If you look at poor and homeless, Invariably, internationally, it's the lower left-hand corner of multidimensional space. You're incapable, untrustworthy, unclean, unattractive. That's what we think. So it's very common, and it's very powerful. We, we just did a couple of studies recently, just because I was interested. I have a friend, Alex Todorov, who's a world champion on face perception. Uh, we show you a face like this. These are very high-quality faces. And here is one. He's wearing a shirt that uh, an independent group of judges agree is poorer than this shirt. You know, this is not about race, so we'll have whites and blacks and everything in between. In this case, class seems to trump race. This dude is wearing a shirt that judges agree is richer than this shirt. I don't know exactly what makes shirts richer and poorer. I can tell you that Hawaiian shirts make you look poorer. That's pretty clear. <laughs> The only question we ask people is how competent is this person? It's the only thing you ask you. You see one of these faces in one shirt or the other, not both, and all you have to say to us is how competent is this person? Now, we are such good mind readers, by the way, that a second is way too long. It gets boring. If you give people half a second or 70 milliseconds as you sort of barely think you saw a face, that's enough to predict how you'll feel if you see it for a full second. So it's all the same. That's how competent people think the poor person is, and that's how competent they think he is when he wears a slightly richer shirt. These are 100 milliseconds, so the first impression, 100 milliseconds that I see you, is enough to have a very different impression of how competent a person you are based on how poor or rich you are. We're not even talking really poor, just a slightly different shirt. You know, these are eight different, basically anything above the, the, like the, the diagonal, means that you're more capable when you're rich than when you're poor for this exact same face. You see, it's pretty very clear, very powerful. It's just very hard to avoid. We tell them, ignore the shirts. We tell them this person makes 80,000 in both cases. We tell them the clothes don't mean anything. Whatever you do, this guy looks more competent when he's wearing a richer shirt. So this is kind of the level of immediate impression we have. And this has enormous implications because remember the context has a big effect. Now, what's interesting about the notion of scarcity is a fun it's a function, if you think about it, not just of the income you get, it's the difficulty of juggling everyday life. For the same income, if I make your life a little bit better, 
if I make your life a little bit easier, if you have automatic deposits and reminders and all the kinds of things that people are doing well get automatically, scarcity becomes easier. And so it's, easy, it's interesting to think of all the things we could do to make life easier. How do we distribute income, for example? When you read about people who get $2 a day, they don't get $2 a day. They get $10 one day and then nothing for a week, which makes it much harder than if you simply had $2 a day. You can't plan, you can't save, you can't do anything. Uh, and there's a lot we can talk about. I'm not going to get into this here very much. I'll give you a couple of quick ones. If you look at um, organizations around America who are doing philanthropic work, they're really trying hard to help the poor. One thing we do invariably is the people come late. They forget to show up. They do a, 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 we, need, we decide we have to educate them. And so what you find is that these philanthropic organizations that are trying to help the poor tell them you must be there by eight or you will not be seen. If you think about it from this perspective, it's a terrible thing to do. The reason I'm late is because I can't juggle my complications. I don't have a babysitter. The bus is unreliable. Trains in America get canceled. I am going to be late. If you become mean, instead of making my life easier, you just impose an extra tax on my bandwidth. It's as if I came to you for $200 loan and you asked me to pay 20 to get it. That's exactly what I don't have. What I don't have is the cognitive bandwidth to be there on time. So there's a way of thinking about how to facilitate the lives of those who need help that's very different from what we intuitively think. This one is great. So it's a good example because it's pretty clear Clinton didn't mean it, but if you remember during the Clinton administration, we introduced a, a five-year lifetime limit on welfare receipt. The idea is if you're an American, you're entitled to five years. The idea was that we would promote work. Now think about it for a second. Imagine if I said to you, you're all busy people, I said to you, this has been a delightful afternoon. If you don't mind, send me a paragraph about some of your thoughts in five years. What do you do? You don't do anything for four years and 11 months and three weeks. And you say, oh, that jerk wanted a paragraph. When you take the poor in America who are juggling and tunneling on getting food for Friday or rent for Monday, and you tell them this five-year limit, you're totally outside their tunnel. They're not going to think about five years from now. Their problem is Monday. And so what you find, in fact, is a lot of welfare recipients who woke up in the morning and said, oh, my God, I'm running out in two months. And so if you think about it from this perspective, whatever your views are about welfare receipt, at least if you want to do this and, and promote work, you need to remind me every six months or maybe 10 to half year limits, something to enter my tunnel, because otherwise it's a terrible model to induce people to work. In general, if you spend more time, and I invite you to do so, what you'll find is that many of us inhabit a context today that's really designed to help us save for retirement, eat healthy, go to the gym, pay on time, all that kind of stuff, whereas the poor in America get pretty much the opposite. Now, I haven't even entered issues of race, which are, in the American context, massively implicated in issues of poverty uh, in complicated ways. Obviously, the majority of poor are white, but psychologically and otherwise behaviorally, this is all a big mishmash. But if you want to look at the justice system and the eviction system, uh, at the banking system, what's very clear is that instead of facilitating the context which matters so much in the lives of the poor, we create a jungle that makes it extremely difficult. I'll give you one last example. If you look at uh, financial literacy training, we spend an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of money teaching financial literacy. Who do we teach financial literacy to, of course, is those who don't look financially very good. Uh, I'm not sure I understand financial literacy better than they do, but they're the ones who get the lessons. So we teach the low-income Americans a lot of financial literacy training. Now, um, a recent meta-analysis of over 200 interventions finds that if you teach people financial literacy, they answer the tests better, but there's no effect whatsoever on their lives. Now, think about that for a minute. Imagine if I taught you swimming 101. So you don't know how to swim, I teach you one semester of swimming. And then I toss you into a massively stormy ocean. It's gonna, you're gonna drown. What I should do to see if I taught you anything is to throw you into our little calm Geneva lake. But when you teach the American poor the basics of finance and throw them into the unregulated, massively unreliable American banking system, they drown. So notice, we don't even know if it's not working. What we know is that in the context in which we put them, without the basic defenses, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that's now being disseminated, with people who sell them ballooning mortgages, 
they drown. And so that's a, a profoundly painful issue. And the reason I think it's interesting, and this is the last two slides, is because it doesn't have to come from malice. It can come from just not getting it. And that's what I think from a behavioral policy perspective is so important. This is a 100-year-old quote. It basically says, if what you do in life somehow depends on human behavior, you better understand human behavior. If you don't understand it and you make it up, you may make up very bad psychology. You may just have the wrong ideas. And I think a lot of the poverty policy, as well as many other policies today, are driven not so much by malice. A lot of Americans are very well intentioned, but by not getting it. <clears throat> I can give you a couple of, I have a giant collection of beautiful bad psychologies. I won't impose them all on you. Here is a simple one. You all know perdo-optimality. Perdo-optimality is one of those beautiful concepts you learn in economics. It based, the, the Italian economist Pareto once explained that if there's a situation in the world where some of us are better off and nobody is worse off, that's a better place to be. So again, if there's a situation where some of us are made better off and nobody is worse off, we should go there. This is a beautiful concept. It's logically unassailable. It's clearly true. But it may not be true in dollars or marks or yens. What do I mean by that? There's plenty of evidence now to suggest that if I took 10 people here in the room and gave them a 100% raise in income and in salary, and the rest of you equally entitled, equally capable people, I gave a 2% raise, there's very good evidence to suggest that well-being in this room will have gone down. So everybody's making more, but well-being will have gone down. Why? Because the evidence suggests that our well-being is determined a little bit by how much we make and a lot by how much we make relative to others who are equally entitled. But we don't think this way. When we do GDP and ignore inequality, we may just be counting the wrong thing. And there's a lot of evidence now that if you look at countries with low inequality, GDP, in fact, buys you happiness. If you go to countries with high inequality, it doesn't. And that's another case where even if you don't have a mean agenda, you're just looking at the wrong, your psychology is wrong. I want to skip one, and I'll give you just the last one. This is, if you want to have a fantastic, behaviorally trained physician, Don Edelmeyer <coughs> in Toronto is a friend and a brilliant physician. So here's a study. Ontario has a big problem. A lot of homeless people hang out in the emergency rooms. It's not a fun sight, what to do. It's a good example because clearly the doctors and the nurses are well-intentioned. But their assumption is, look, Ontario is cold. The emergency room gives you a cup of tea. We can't be nice to them because the problem will never go away. Based on some early interviews with some homeless people in the emergency room, they decided to run a randomized control trial, very nicely organized published in the Lancet. And what they do now is when the homeless come in, half of them are assigned to the standard treatment. The other half are assigned to a compassionate treatment, where an intern attaches him or herself to the homeless and takes good care of them, asks them what they can do to help them, is super nice to them. What's remarkable is that upon later evaluation, those who got the compassionate treatment are significantly less likely to come back to this or any other hospital in the province. And the point is that if you come with a non-life-threatening ailment and you feel that nobody took you seriously, you come again. If you feel that people did the best they could for you, emergency rooms are not appealing enough to come back to. And so it was just the wrong psychology. By being nice to these people, you resolve the problem that you kept making worse by, by being mean. Again. Malice is nowhere there, it's just a bad interpretation of a behavior. And so we finish the book by basically arguing that you have to think of life as kind of a complicated cockpit. I like this metaphor because Americans are all about, you know, people taking responsibility. So look, we know there's fantastic examples in aviation. If you are a talented, very responsible pilot, and I design a bad cockpit, or for example, you push the stick to go up and pull to go down, I kill you. If you're a talented and, and careful pilot who takes responsibility and I design a good co cockpit, I allow you to fly beautifully. And so if you think about all of us, all of us inhabit a cockpit that's pretty friendly. But as you go down to places that need more help, the cockpit is much less conducive to good flight. And again, the point is that if you design it well, those who are not trying will not make it, but those who are trying and taking some kind of responsibility, 
will then be able to thrive if we design a cockpit that's, that's, more, that's more conducive to success. So that's kind of the idea. My last comment. Um, if you're into evaluation, there's a really interesting lurking logic here. Typically, when we evaluate interventions, what do we do? So uh, let's say Treasury designs a new financial instrument that's supposed to help people. They introduce the financial instrument. We give it to some people. We we'll wait two years, and then we see how they did financially. Okay? But now look, the bandwidth I'm talking about, the, the limited bandwidth we have, it's the only bandwidth I have. That's the one I use to do my finances, help my kids with their homework, remember to eat healthy. That's the only one I have. If Treasury gave me an instrument that made my finances easier, a very reasonable thing for me might be to say, thank you, now I have to work less on my finances, I can spend more time on my kids' homework. But that means that when Treasury comes two years later and checks how the program is doing, it needs to check not my financial situation, but how many kids are doing in school, which is not something we typically do. So how you evaluate the success of an intervention that's helped me with very limited bandwidth would really change if you realize that it's exactly where you help me that I can now devote less resources and I can do better in other places where you're not looking. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here. Thank you, guys. So I agree, I agree with you until the last thing you said. So my interpretation is that some change and some don't, we don't know who's who. So uh, your point is well taken. Um, I have not touched on the cultural thing. There's no doubt that the poor, and by the way, the rich too, do very bad things because of the culture they're in. And that's different from the cognitive story I just told. So what I'm trying to show you is that even when you know how to do things and you want to do them well, when you know, scarcity imposes its ugly head and overwhelms you, you do things badly. The idea that you walk around with bad ideas or cultural norms that have shaped how you think is, is a separate story and it's certainly there. How it plays out is actually complicated. You know, I remember as a kid growing up in Israel, we would have substitute teachers with numbers on our arms from the camps. I was 10 and I remember thinking, why is one of them massively depressed and the other one a clown? They graduated from the same horror and they responded completely differently. And I think when I say about the depression, I think that you're describing some it's a classic story. Some keep going with bread in their pockets and others buy Ferraris. It can go either way. I don't think we've understood. Maybe the psychiatrists in the room can help us with this. From what I know, it's very hard to predict. But that issue of how culture shapes and how you develop is a whole different story. By the way, there's many developmental issues many people in this room know. Growing up in poverty actually changes the physical aspects of your brain. I'm not touching on that again. There is some, some fluidity there. There's some ability to recover, but it's a complicated story. I'm touching really on real time, on, off, load, less load, and ability to function. Everything else kept constant. But it's a super relevant issue. Yep. In um, clinical medicine, we consider an ethical responsibility to do things like informed consent and shared decision making, which involves a lot of cognitive load, interpreting risk, and share risk with patients. And that's right. Do we have any? I think this, is, this merits a semester. I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, look, you, of course you're doing the right thing, but you're also, I think you're totally right. And I think most of your patients would rather have a doctor tell them at the end of the day than consult with them. I think there's data on that. And it's certainly true, obviously, for those who are, have scarcity where they're less educated, more deferential, more afraid, have less time to think, that much rather you tell them. Having said that, of course, you know, the, some of the impulses you describe are very well placed. So it's a subtle game. Part of it is how and when to tell it. Now, I'm not saying you have the time to worry about all this, but part of it is a little bit, I mean, I have a couple, of, let me give you two slides that are amusing. Um, there's a whole question of, if I want to influence you, when do I give you the information? How do I do it? In the classics work on persuasion, there are two extremes. On the one hand, I need your central processor. I need you to listen to me fully. I give you an argument, you weigh the pros and the cons, you think about the logical deductions, and you consider it and you decide what to do. 
The other extreme, you're busy doing other things and I just get to you subliminally. I put a poster of Coca-Cola on the wall. You're busy, you don't even know you saw it. You leave the room and you have an urge for a Coke. That's the other side. Now, it turns out that if you look at how we transmit information, that plays a big role. So what poster do I put on the wall to give you the urge to save for retirement? Nobody has found the right poster. So if you look at ads, that's, here, that's what they look like. So you basically have to get a master's degree. You have to stop everything you're doing and get a master's degree to understand well, how to save for retirement. It's complicated. If I wanted to convince you to smoke, I don't want you to pay attention to me. I want you to be busy. And while you're very, very busy, I'm going to flash you know, pictures of beautiful people and Italian villas and you know, in the US maybe a few guns. And I'll give, you the urge to, I'll give you the urge to smoke. Now, this is not unrelated to your story. Because if you want to come to me, you know, wh when do you come to me? Do you come to me when I'm preoccupied, when I have a moment to listen? Do you come to me when I'm worried about Monday or after I got paid? This, and I'm not saying you, the physician, it's always a story. But in general. How to transmit information to people who are overloaded becomes a really interesting question. Can you find them in a moment when there's more openness to it as opposed to less? So in a case like yours, uh, you know, it's probably true for most people. You probably want to give some of this information not at the moment when I'm most preoccupied with the news you gave me, but at some other moment. Uh, but I, but I, I think what you're asking is a super interesting question. And it's true, I think, not only for people who are financially under scarcity, but people who are just under scarcity, period. You know, um, when I said to you that um, people come, when they're worried about financial issues, they do less well on exams or on tests. Of course, that's not only the rubric of the poor. There's nothing different about the poor than the rest of us, except that poverty, you know, you don't take a vacation. That's the only difference. So we know that if you come into a, a clinic, a classroom, a place of work, and you had a major fight with your spouse that morning, or you left a kid home who's sick, you will be functioning at lower IQ that day. Anybody who has these unavoidable trains of thought will function less well. So, so the poor have them constantly and don't take a vacation very often, although, some, of course, some go up and down, as opposed to others who, when you have a problem, thankfully, you know, the kid hopefully gets better and you're back to normal. That's the difference. But I think that, in some sense, what you're questioning is probably true for many patients, and it's an interesting sensitivity to develop. We've all experienced, I think, situations where we see a family that's relatively, quote, poor financially. They have a nuclear family. Their children all become successes. We also see a wealthy family. And their children turn into drug addicts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it the culture underlying the financial situation that helps people through, or is it, I mean, what's the correlation between culture and success relative to finances? Uh, it's a very complicated question. And I think, I think the culture of the financially wealthy in America sucks, and they're doing fine. So, I mean, the correlation, <laughs> the correlation is low. Um, now, and I don't mean sex just, I don't mean it's heartless. I mean, it's just not wise. I don't mean that it's, I want to be clear here. It's not that they're being mean. That's not my business. They're just not being very clever. But they still do fine because there's so much cushion. Uh, for the poor, no doubt there are successes. Now, of course, first of all, we have to be very careful with the outliers because they're exactly our way of expressing what's typically not the case. So for every successful poor family, the many who are trying terribly hard and not succeeding. And so it's a complicated story. Um, look, uh, there's no doubt cultural issues. You can, you can literally control for culture and show that equal SES makes a difference, depending on how much value you put on education, how much value you put on other things, no doubt. So these things are, are not zero one. And everything I'm doing, if remember I said, I'm not denying culture, community effects, peer effects. All these things are part of it. Uh, but, you know, keeping everything constant, a well-intentioned, hard-working family is much better chance if the context helps them than if it doesn't. One, one last question. Um, well, for decades, we know how powerful context is. We've seen countries that raise taxes on alcohol and smoking and change behavior. I've worked with people 
people who have intellectual disabilities and seeing the same human being on the same day behave in ways so dramatically different, you wouldn't believe it. We've known that context matters. Why do we still have this idea, if we want change, we have to start with the person, we have to motivate the person to change, and then we need an individual intervention. Why don't we do the collective, contextual, environmental first, and then for those for whom it doesn't work, then we do an individual. I mean, we always start with the idea every change and every behavior should be at the individual level. Well, why can't we let go of that? <laughs> I'm not sure if this is that rhetorical or if it's... <laughs> well, I, 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 do, do, you have some, do you have some insights? Probably the same ones you have. Probably the same ones you have. So look, I mean, first of all, we have the classic behavioral stuff, you know, the fundamental attribution error. Some, some, so we know from social psych, for example, the following. If I lose patience with my daughter, I say to myself, you know, I haven't slept well. You know, the flights today were terrible. I'm, so, I'm tired. If you lose patience with your daughter, it's because you're a bad father or a bad mother. That's the classic asymmetry that people clearly impose. I'm aware of the situational factors that are impacting what I do. I mean, I feel them. With you, all I see is that you're acting badly. So this is number one. And that's going to give you a lot of this frustration. Having said that, you know, I always joke that I'm trying to change. I'm not going to change people. I'm just trying to make Americans a bit more European. Because, <laughs> because we do know that this in, there are, there's real research on this. If I give you 100 points to divide between chance and skill, between luck and responsibility, Europeans are more sensitive to context than Americans. So there is that. And that, I think, has to do with an American sense of individuality, maybe Protestantism somewhere, and the, the allergic reaction to government intervention. And at the end of the day, a lot of this, it, it, it could be state, it could be federal, but somebody has to arrange it, it's not me. And Americans just don't like government intervention. And that, of course, comes in the way of designing context. Context can't be designed by individuals. So all those impulses, uh, you know, you can, you can like them or you cannot like them. All of them drive in a direction of a resistance to designing contexts that are more effective. In the workplace, if you look at Facebook, they have designed a context that's very nice. But it's, you know, it's, it's a private company. So uh, I lied when I said the last question because I'm going to take pride. <laughs> systems to help uh, people in need and have them fill out the gazillions of complicated forms to show us pictures. Worse than that, only have the offices open during working hours during the week. And if you have a job, you're the working poor, you can't get there, you're going to lose time to work, your kids should be taken care of. Is, is, it, is it really uh, some nefarious behavior or is it truly stupidity that we do not understand the cost in terms of cognitive uh, support, the things that will happen to their kids? I mean, just from a cost-benefit analysis, it would make sense to make it all more friendly. Uh -huh. We know that. Yeah. We know that. Is it a matter of educating political leadership, or what is the interpretation of why are we operating like that? So, you know, you know, it's a great question. I think it's a mixture of the two. I have some examples we can at least argue that probably they didn't mean for it to fail. Uh, so it's probably not what's going on. You know, Clinton got nothing from people not being aware of it. He wanted them to work. They just weren't paying attention. It's a very clear case where it's unlikely anybody wanted it to misfire this way. Uh, Second Harvest, this organization, collects examples of food stamps from all 50 states. Some of them, you know, it depends how your proclivity. Either you'll laugh or you'll cry. But in any case, these are badly designed application forms for food stamps. And in several of these cases, it's not at all clear that anybody wants you to not get food stamps. You can probably assume that they want you to get food stamps, but they design them terribly. I think, in general, if you look at policy, if, who, who, if somebody doesn't want the program to work, it's usually the governor. The person who designs the form, they don't have an agenda. And so if you look at the hanging chads, the famous example of the voting in Florida, it's not the White House who designed this chad. It's some dude who designed this chad. And if you look at this chad, you know it's going to be a disaster. So. I think very often the design, the implementation, the forms, the language are not at the level that it's likely to suspect that this person intentionally caused the, food, the poor not to get food. It's very unlikely. Now, of course, there are cases like these, but I think many of them are just a lack of appreciation. 
Look, we teach this every day. I teach my students at Wilson School costs and benefits. I don't, but many people. If I teach you costs and benefits, think about it very seriously. Costs and benefits. Here's a benefit. Food for your kids. What's the cost? I'll do anything. Who cares if the form is two pages, four pages? I train you to assume it doesn't matter. Now, of course, cost benefits doesn't capture what people do, and as a result, we don't give any attention to stuff that seems trivial and ends up making all the difference. Thank you.